Hello and welcome to the They Can Talk show, sponsored by Clever Pet, the creators of Fluent Pet. Uh, I'm your host, Rachel Slotkey, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Alexis Devine, also known as Bunny's Mom. Hello, Alexis, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. How's it going? It's going good. It's going good. So we had so many questions come in, which was very exciting that we might even need to do a part two of this. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in and ask you some of the questions that came from our community ahead of time. Uh, so first off, can you just tell us a little bit about who Bunny is and how you're teaching her to communicate? Yeah, sure. She's a, a 16 month old sheepadoodle. Um, been in my life since she was eight weeks old. And I, like many other Fluent Pent users, found Christina Hunger and um, was wildly inspired by what she was doing with her own dog, Stella. So I devoured her blog. And before even bringing Bunny home, I had an outside button by the door waiting. And uh, within just a few weeks, she was using it consistently to let us know that she wanted to go out. And at that point in time, it was game on. And we've been expanding and changing our board ever since. So how many buttons does Bunny have on her board right now? I think she has 78 buttons. Wow, that's a lot of buttons. <laughs> a lot of buttons, yeah. So you started very young with Bunny, but is this something that older dogs can learn how to do too? Or is it something you have to start with when they're very young? No, I think um, dogs of all ages can learn how to do this. There are plenty of older dogs that are part of the study right now that are learning how to do this. I think it um, mostly depends on your connection and the time you're able to dedicate to the process. Can you um, can you take us through how how you teach but Bunny to uh, use these buttons on some of the more tangible words like cat or outside versus some of the more abstract words like love or mad? Yeah, so um, the first two words we started with were outside and play. And those are pretty straightforward. Um, the outside button was by the door. Every time we would be going outside, I would press the outside button, I would say outside, and then uh, Bunny and I would go outside. And then we'd come inside, I'd press the outside button again, I'd say outside, all done. And with play, same thing, I would press the play button, I would pick up her favorite toy, I would play with her, I'd put it down, and we'd repeat that several times. Um, pretty straightforward. With more abstract, abstract concepts like um, love you and emotions, it's more, um, for me, it was more a matter of capturing that in her. So for example, mad or concerned, when I saw that she was in a state of emotional arousal, I could use the button concerned to capture that emotion while I saw her expressing it and um, just modeled that consistently until she began using it herself. So you did the same kind of modeling method for both the very concrete words and the more abstract words, is that right? Well, for some of the some of the really abstract words, um, like when, um, I've been modeling those in context with other words because modeling the when button by itself, for example, doesn't mean anything. And although it's a word that I use in conversation with her when I'm just talking, um, adding that button to the board, she didn't know the exactly what that button meant before we added it to the board. So I had to start using it in context with other words in order for her to learn it. And I think she's still processing it, but added the when button, when go park. Uh, so I'd model when go park. And then after I said that I'd model go park now. So that's how I'm trying to teach her to learn the abstract concept of when, for example. That actually brings me to the next question, uh, which is words like why, where, what, when, how do you how do you work through those? Uh, a lot of it is sort of uh, putting puzzle pieces together and um, using the words in context with other words. It's basically like I'm having a conversation with myself. So I would model what Bunny wants, and then I would model a response that I could imagine her wanting. Bunny want play, and then we'd play, and I would do that over and over and over again um, in various contexts. Or if she requested play, I would model what bunny want, bunny want play. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Um, so how many, this was another question that came in. How many hours do you spend uh, training bun bunny on these words? Maybe like when you first started versus once you already had an understanding of some words, like what was that timeline like? So when we first started, um, I imagined that I'd have to dedicate hours a day to this process. 
And so in addition to our um, obedience and trick training and, you know, the other sort of stuff we were consistently working on, I tried to a lot an amount of time, like three, 10 minute training sessions, something like that. But what I found was that she's much less responsive and um, sort of shows stress signals when I bring her over to the buttons and she's not already actively engaged with the buttons. And the last thing I want is for her um, to be stressed, especially around the buttons, because this is all about us sort of deepening our connection. So um, it all happens very, very organically now. There's no like set amount of time that we spend per day training. She'll walk over to the buttons of her own accord several times throughout the day and sort of initiate conversation. And I will turn that into a teaching moment. Um, so it's it's sort of all upon Bunny to set the terms of the learning. Um, so I, I myself have a dog who is uh, learning to use the Fluent Pet button board to communicate. Um, and I know I'm, I'm constantly asked if we can, you know, show it like a trick, ask her to do it. Like, like you said, roll over, you work on that kind of trick training. Um, so obviously, you know, how is this not a trick and, um, how do you then go about engaging Bunny to interact with the board, to answer questions and that kind of stuff? Um, well, it's, it's definitely not a trick. I, we've done so many interviews where, um, people have been like, okay, here's the script. I'm like, well, it doesn't really work that way or okay now's the part of the interview where we got to see bunny doing her thing and i was like well if she wants to that's how it works if she's got something to say she's going to say it um for us um the answering question parts is only effective if she starts the conversation like if she goes over to the board and she says uh you know want outside then i can ask her a question like when do you want outside and the conversation will sort of flow like that but if i am just sitting here right now and bunny's right over here i wish i wish you all could see her she's chewing on her little no belly. bunny yes um but if i interrupt what she's doing right now and i ask her a question um the likelihood that she'll give me an answer is not high so it really is um all sort of bunny's impetus to communicate and like following through with that and reinforcing the process when she's already engaged in it yeah that that makes a lot of sense um what about when you're on the go does bunny ever get frustrated when she doesn't have access to her buttons it doesn't seem like that to me um i've spent a lot of time trying to understand her on her terms um sort of watching her body language and learning to communicate with her without the buttons. And when we're out doing stuff, she's like thoroughly engaged, you know, so it doesn't seem that she's got a, a need. I haven't noticed a need for her to, to be expressing something with buttons. Yep, that makes sense. Um, a lot of people have picked up on the fact that you also have a cat um, and Bunny seems to be kind of obsessed with this cat. Um, is there People want to know, is there a reason your cat isn't learning to communicate using the buttons as well? So we actually, when we brought Bunny home, we had three cats. Um, one of them has since passed, um, but we have two cats now. We have Uni and Ringo. Uni's the one that a lot of people see all the time. He's the sort of big orange bread loaf looking cat, orange tabby. And then we've got Ringo, who's a fluffy white cat. And um, I think there are a few reasons. My Relationship with Bunny is completely different than my relationship with the cats is. Um, I love them, uh, but Bunny and I have a much deeper connection. And I think, I think a lot of this communication is based on the strength of the connection. I also feel like my cats aren't as eager to please. So I think it would be a lot more challenging to teach them the buttons because they're not, um, they're not as excited about a sort of back and forth communicative experience. Um, and they also like sleep all day, every day. So I, I don't know when I'd find the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no energy to do it. Um, so you said you had 78 buttons, is that correct? I think so, yes. 78. And how do you organize them? Well, they're organized based on the Fitzgerald key, which is something when you buy a fluent pet kit that that talks about. So each hex tile is a different sentence part. We've got like people, uh, we've got places, we've got actions, um, sentence starters, and that helps Bunny sort of compartmentalize the words. So instead of having to know, oh, this word is randomly in this huge mass of words, you know, these are my people and I memorize the six buttons within the people so I know where they are. So it, it sort of helps her have a better understanding of what tile she needs to go to to organize her sentences. Hmm. 
theory. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to just like remembering where 78 <laughs> different buttons are. Right. Um, we, yeah. yeah, that's how we started. We started with the grid, um, similar to the one that Christina Hunger has. And uh, the problem that we were encountering was that anytime we'd add a row of buttons, she'd only sort of access the outside of the grid. Um, so I definitely think that having them be sort of compartmentalized like that has helped her be able to express herself more clearly. Does it probably helps you remember where they are a little bit too. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, a question from our chat, why did you name her bunny? Um, well, she's got these beautiful floppy ears and she hops around like a bunny rabbit. But the real reason, um, is because Johnny and I affectionately refer to everything cute as bunny. And before Bunny came home, I was like, can we just call her Bunny? We're going to end up calling her Bunny anyways. And he was like, yeah. And it stuck. It stuck. <laughs> Have you noticed that Bunny's personality has changed at all since uh, she's learned how to, this new way to communicate with you? Well, she's never not had this method um, to communicate with me. So it's hard to say if there's been a shift um, specifically because of that. But I've definitely noticed her personality change, um, you know, from when she was a puppy and now she's an adolescent. She's super, super sassy. Um, and I imagine it'll just sort of continue to evolve and I'm loving every minute of it. Is there a, is there a conversation that you guys have had using the buttons that has surprised you the most? Any of the times when she's been able to tell me that she's in pain are um, pretty moving to me. There were two times this summer where she had a, a foxtail on in her paw that I wasn't aware of. And she was able to tell me by saying, ouch, paw or stranger paw, and then putting her paw in my hand. Um, and then I found it. And frequently those will require medical intervention and we were able to avoid that. So those are pretty powerful moments. Yeah, I bet. So speaking of ouch, a lot of people want to know, how do you teach something like that while being ethical about it? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so we taught Bunny the word ouch uh, when she was a tiny pup because we used it um, to train bite inhibition. So anytime she had teeth on skin and it was too hard, I'd say ouch and I'd sort of like whimper. So we've been using that word from day one. Um, and I, over the last eight months, have gotten a, a lot of tattoo work done. So I figured that would be a really interesting word to add to the board at some point. So anytime I got a tattoo, I'd let her smell the wound and I would say, ouch, when she got spayed, I used the word ouch a whole lot. Anytime, um, you know, she has a, a little cut on her paw from a barnacle, I used ouch. So I've been using that and modeling that ethically um, for as long as I can remember. I don't think there's ever a reason to uh, hurt your dog to teach them ouch. Yeah, no, definitely. Um... And how do you balance things like uh, potty training with the consistency of using the buttons? Because obviously, if you're potty training your dog, you might not want them to go out at any time that they want to go out. So how do you how do you balance that? Um, it's a bit of a struggle because right now she's talking a lot about poop and potty and she seems to be using those two words to to get outside when she doesn't necessarily have to go outside. So I know, I mean, I just sort of use my best judgment. Like, I know you went poop about 15 minutes ago and you went potty about 10 minutes ago, you probably don't have to go again. So now might be an appropriate time for me to say no or for you to express yourself in a different way. So if she were to say poop or potty and I know that she had just gone um, and then I said no and she requested outside, I'd probably let her out to reinforce that saying what she actually wants um, will We'll get a better result. Mm. Um, so if you are traveling with Bunny, uh, do you bring the buttons with you? I know you said when she's away from them, she seems to be all right. But what about if you're going away for like a long weekend or something like that? Um, it's a lot of buttons. So it's a lot of pieces to kind of pick up and, and go with you. How do you how do you handle that? Well, we haven't been doing a ton of traveling because of the pandemic. Um, but I imagine that if we were somewhere for more than three days in a row, we would take them. I'd be really curious to see how she uses them out of this context. She's never had that opportunity before. Um, but I think if it were just a couple days, it wouldn't be sort of worth the hassle. Yeah, it is sort of a, it's a lot to transport. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I, would, I would be really, really interested to see how she um, used them in a different location. Mm. Well, you'll have to keep us uh, updated once we we're on the other side of this. <laughs> uh, someone from the chat wants to know, do you recommend using your dog's paw to teach her to use the button? Like hand yeah. over hand? 
Oh, um, no, I don't recommend hand over paw, but I do recommend paw targeting exercises. Um, I don't use treats with the buttons I never have. Um, I've tried to keep those very separate. I don't have any food related buttons at all. Um, but an exercise you can do is like take anything and, you know, away from the buttons, have your um, dog learn to put their paw on any random object. You can reward with treats for that as long as they're not the buttons. That's sort of my philosophy. And then they're sort of primed for um, wanting to put their paw on the buttons when you're working with the buttons. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. So not not grabbing their paw and showing it, but working on that target practice, like using exactly. that sticky note and then transferring that over to, to hit it, something like that. Exactly. I think keeping it all voluntary is really important. So you mentioned that uh, you recently added a word that Bunny didn't know before. Does that mean that the majority of the words that you add buttons to that she already knows the concepts? I think for most of the words that we started with, um, they were a lot more cut and dry. So she already had built an association with the, those words. And that's the way I tried to proceed for a long time. And then I just didn't know how to help her understand some of the more abstract concepts without putting them on the board and modeling them in context. Because I felt like if they were on the board, she would have a sense that they were words that she would have to pay more attention to. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Um, so I, what about like um, someone's really interested in how on earth you teach the concept of time um, now, later? How do, how do you teach a dog later? <clears throat> well, um, she requests play. I model play now. We play immediately. Um, she requests play. I model play soon. I wait five minutes and then we play. Um, and then later is quite a bit more abstract, but she requests play. I say play later. And then maybe like an hour down the line, I'm, I come circle back around like we play now. Now we're going to play. Now is later. Um, and then in terms of yesterday, today, tomorrow, morning, afternoon, and night, I don't think she understands those yet, but I think she's really, really interested in understanding them because she, she'll several times a week, she'll go over to those buttons, make very clear eye contact with me and just sort of explore combinations of today now, uh, tomorrow before, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I, uh, you know, I'm just sort of winging it with all of this from the beginning. And, uh, you know, every morning we wake up, I say morning now, good morning. Um, when it's afternoon, like as soon as it hits noon, afternoon now, good afternoon. We go afternoon walk. Um, and same, same as soon as uh, the sun sets and it's dark, it's night now. So I'm just trying to show her based on time of day and context, what all of those concepts mean. So a lot of repetition, it sounds like. Tons of repetition all day, every day. Is um is Bunny learning new words faster, do you think? Or about the same speed? Or it, there's there no way of knowing? I, I think it's hard to know. Um, the words we're adding right now are just like crazy concepts. So I think it'll take her longer to learn them, but it takes her less time to explore them now because she knows the sort of game, right? Um, new button on the board, let's figure out what it is. So almost instantaneously, whenever a new button is added, she's eager to... Uh, use it and hear it and then use it in context with other words. I have, and um, what buttons have you found to be essential for basic conversation, like maybe the first 15 or so to introduce? Um, outside and play, they're just so highly motivating. And they're things that hopefully you do several times a day with your dog. Um, adding buttons with the names of her friends has been really fun too, because she's so highly motivated by her best friend, um, Tango, right now. And there she is. Hi, Bunny. Um, so yeah, adding the names of her friends has been really fun. Um, Love You, I think, is maybe more important for me than it has been for her. Um, but it does sort of generate this oxytocin exchange that feels really lovely. And it's been really wonderful to sort of consider how she might perceive that concept. Um, so it's a, it's a fun one for me to explore at least. What else has been really important? Uh, we just added smell. And I think that one's going to be really important going forward um, because dogs sense of smell is so important to them, um, much less so to us, but it'll be interesting to see what she has to say about that. 
It's uh, it's funny. Someone in the chat said, "Where is Bunny now?" And then Bunny just came oh. back across the okay. screen. Yeah, I can like. So there she is, everyone. There's Bunny. She's here with us. Come here, Bunny. Come here. Joining the conversation. <laughs> there we go. Here she is. Oh, hi, Bunny. <laughs> Looking for some love. Yeah. Um. So, how many new words do you add at a time? Uh, would you add morning, afternoon, night around the same time so that you can help her understand the differences or one at a time? I did add um, morning, afternoon, and night on the same day. And I added uh, today, tomorrow, and yesterday on the same day. I felt like they were concepts that needed to all be there at the same time so that she could start to differentiate um, while she was exploring. Um, but sometimes like smell, I just added by itself. We've got a couple of other senses on the board, see and hear. Um, and I thought smell by itself was a really big one. There's a lot to explore with that. So that one went onto the board by itself. So it depends, depends on the word if it's useful. Yeah. So both. Quick answer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, have you noticed whether or not Bunny presses specific buttons in a consistent order? For example, play now versus now play? She doesn't seem to. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem like she has a consistent syntax to me at all. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Is uh, does Bunny plan Bunny's plan of learning stop after a while, or are you guys just exploring her full potential? Yeah, I think we'll go um, as far as we can. If she ever ceases to be interested or stops interacting with the buttons, we'll probably just stop um, because again, this is sort of about our relationship, and I want to do what's best for her. Um, but as far as we can go with her still enjoying it and still um, not displaying signs of frustration, we'll just take it as far as we can. Mm, yeah. And so does that include uh, all tenses of the words, past, present, future, do you think? I don't know. I mean, I think, I think the more words we can give her to express as many things things as possible is probably more important than um, as many tenses as possible, right? Like talk about as, as much as you possibly can and we'll sort of fill in the gaps, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> um, do you, this came from the chat, uh, do you bring the button outside with you for poop so that you can then model it while it's happening? No, I just act like a crazy person and say, good poop, 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 poop. <laughs> You know, I could really relate to that, to be honest. Um, so is your, uh, is your husband dedicated to this too? Any issues with inconsistency with training between the two of you? Um, I, I definitely train a lot more than he does. Um, he's involved and, and he really enjoys trying to communicate with her and the buttons, but I have essentially like memorized all of their placements. So when he's trying to model something for her, sometimes it'll take him a couple of minutes to find the right buttons. And at that point, Bunny's like wandered off. She's like, oh, this bone over here is interesting. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it could be challenging for other people to come in and try and communicate with a learner using a system that's already been well-established. Um, just because we're so familiar with how it works and I'm so familiar with how she communicates with me and she's familiar with how I use the buttons with her. But um, it'd be really interesting to see a complete stranger come in and use the system with her. I'd, I'd be excited to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the same goes for any type of dog training, right? Like I see that even when my friend tries to tell my dog to do something simple like sit or, you know, it's just not the same and they won't always react in the, the same way. Yeah, totally. Um. <clears throat> So you mentioned that she's not very treat motivated uh, or you try not to use treats for the, you know, to motivate her. What is she motivated by in terms of uh, learning the buttons? She is motivated by feeling understood, I think. Um, yeah. Yes, I think that is right. I can see frustration in her when she pushes a combination of buttons that clearly has communicative intent and I don't understand it. Um, and when I do get it right, she is such a happy dog. She's like waggy and smiley and wants scritches and comes in for cuddles. So I think, um, yeah, I think she's motivated by my emotional satisfaction and motiv motivated by feeling understood, which mm. 
highly relatable. Sure. And how do you handle uh, if she has like a tantrum using her buttons? What do you do then? Normally I laugh at her. <laughs> sure. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty funny. Uh, but yeah, if she's getting super frustrated, we walk away, like I'll, I'll tear it aside. We'll work on some like traditional training, do something really fun with treats, just leave it alone, move away from the frustration. Cause if I, I mean, I get frustrated too, when I'm not understanding what she's trying to say, I'm like, that was amazing. Like five, six button push, but it made no sense to me. Um, that's frustrating and dogs are super empathetic. So I don't want her to sense my frustration and feel like it's a less desirable thing for her to do. So we just move away, we do something else and then come back later when we're both less frustrated. That makes sense. Um, have you, you know, some people use um, hand signals with training. Have you ever tried combining the words with hand signals or do you do it separately? How does that work? Um, I, I've never used hand signals with the buttons. I, I use hand signals. I have visual cues for all of our like obedience and trick training. Um, but a lot of the words are not, you know, we're not using the same words. So I haven't, um, I haven't, it's a great idea. I probably should learn ASL. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, they say that, you know, dogs uh, are more quick to learn something with, with a signal and then to add the word. Sure. When we were first starting our training, we would do um, training sessions that were only like visual cues only, like sit down, spin, yep, the pretty, all of that. So I think it'd be a very effective tool. I just haven't gotten around to it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you've just been doing seventy-eight buttons. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, would you? Someone in the chat wants to know uh, if you would try to teach her pronouns at any point. Yes, we have I, you, and we on the board right now. Um, and that's just crazy. We'll see what happens. Um, the other day, I thought it was a really, uh, a really amazing interaction. Um, it was like this time of night and Johnny had gone out to get some takeout. And Bunny went over to the board and she pressed, we love you, why went? As if to say, uh, we, like Bunny and I love Johnny, why did you leave? And I was like, oh, we just went to get some takeout food. It's okay, he'll be back soon. And she said, dad, bye. And then came and settled on the couch with me. So um, she's explored the pronouns a little bit. I, I felt like that was a pretty powerful interaction. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see where it goes. They're super confusing. I don't even like, I can't even grasp how to teach them. It's very, very complicated feeling. Yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure. <laughs> um, so has Bunny ever spoken to another animal also using buttons? And is that something that you might try to try at some point? Like if Bunny and Stella were in the same room, what do you think would happen? Yeah, I don't know. She um, she definitely used the buttons uh, when Spooky, our, our old cat who has since passed, was around. She used the buttons to... Um, to talk to her, she pressed play, play, come now, play, that sort of thing. And I think with Uni, she's um, she's used buttons to communicate a little bit, although it's it's hard to tell because she looks at me first. It's as if she's talking about the cat more so than with the cat. But um, I would really enjoy getting another dog at some point. So we might be able to uh, find out what will happen. Very cool. It would be a, a mini bunny. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so you mentioned um, this research that you're contributing to, and uh, the last They Can Talk show, we interviewed uh, Federico Rosano, who is uh, conducting this this big research pro project with a lot of different animals. Uh, what are you hoping to find out from the research? I mean, I would love to know what part of this isn't random, like what exactly is going on. Um, there are a lot of times where, I mean, if you've been following my journey for a while, um, you know that I've been skeptical from the start. Uh, and there are a lot of moments throughout the day where Bunny might press some buttons that don't necessarily make sense. Maybe she's exploring. Um, could it all be random? Um, could it be the very, very beginnings of receptive and expressive language? Um, so I hope that the study at the Comparative Cognition Lab will be able to shed some light on that and sort of tell us what direction things are moving in. Yeah, with a little more concrete data. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you work full-time while working with Bunny? I am a small business owner. 
Um, and business has been pretty slow since um, the pandemic hit. So I've had a lot of time uh, to spend with Bunny uh, working on this. But I worked from home before that as well. So I still was able to dedicate quite a bit of time to Bunny. Mm. And how many, um, about how many times a day would you say on average Bunny hits a button? An approximate. Yeah, I don't know, like 20 maybe. Um, if it's raining out, like two. She's very, <laughs> she doesn't rain. very rainy. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'd say, and that's like time spent at the board, not just like one button push. So like a time spent at the board could be like a five minute long sort of back and forth where I'm trying to figure out what she's trying to get at. And I ask her questions and she responds. And then I walk away for a while and then she goes back and says some more things. So that's like maybe 20 times that that happens throughout the day, I'd say on average. Oh, wow. That's a lot. It's a lot, yeah. Um, someone from the chat wants to know, how proficient do you wait for her to be with the newest button before adding more? Not as proficient as I should be probably uh i'm yeah i think i add i add buttons before i'm 100 percent certain that she knows exactly what the meaning of the previous button was because i'm constantly thinking in my head what might bunny want to communicate right now and not be able to and then i'm like ah oh, she's got to have this word otherwise she's just going to be furiously trying to find a way to communicate this and not be able to. So I, I may move a little bit faster than I ought to, but again, uh, I am just sort of making this all up as I go. Yeah. Um, it's a really creative process and I, you know, everyone's gonna find what works for their learner and um, sort of make it their own. So if Bunny didn't have a word, for example, would she, do you, or have you seen any examples of her making up coining her own phrase to mean something that she doesn't have a word for yet she has called a deer a cat hippo <laughs> she has called a seal a water hippo um she called a seagull a water bird um what was another one i feel like there was another one just recently but i don't remember what it was you might have to like make a book about that like all of bunny's made up words yes <laughs> Uh, so someone in the chat would like to know, um, uh, they, they, they said that they saw the videos of her existential crisis. Does she recognize herself in the mirror now? I don't know. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think so, but she's not like afraid of herself. And, um, if we're standing together in the mirror and she can see me and I wave and say, hi, bunny, she'll turn around and come running to me. Um, I don't know if that means that she heard me and was like, oh, mom's behind me. Let's ignore this stranger. Or if she's like, oh, that person is mom. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> uh, so going off back to the study that we were talking about, um, you have multiple cameras set up. Uh, how many do you have not at this point? And is the camera always on or is that something that you can control? I have five cameras. It will, uh, it'll be six as of tomorrow. They're always on. Some of them are recording events and some of them are um, recording nonstop. And soon we'll have um, like a live stream function that will be sent directly to the Comparative Cognition Lab. 24-7, the cameras are on. 24-7, wow. Yeah. Um, so another chat question. Uh, someone says, we've started using the buttons last week. My Weimerheimer is as intense in pressing the buttons as anything in her life. Do you have any tips to get her to be gentler? Be gentler? Um, well, you could work with the paw targeting exercises that I was recommending before and sort of shape a calmer button press. So once you have her, he or her, he or her. Um once you have them 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 yeah once you have them um consistently pressing it if they're pressing it really aggressively you can um stop rewarding for an aggressive press and only re reward um 
incrementally gentler presses, if that makes sense. So you're shaping a, a softer press on that, um, whatever the target is. And hopefully that'll also transfer to the buttons. That might be one thing. Um, but I know that I've heard from some other uh, folks that their learners were really, really eager at first too. And eventually they just sort of settled down. But I think shaping a calmer um, paw target might be helpful. Hmm. Um, so I would like to tell, you know, but Bunny is amazing, obviously. Um, what has it been like to go from nearly zero to six million followers in just a few months? It's bonkers. Uh, yeah, it's really overwhelming. Um, I'm yeah. super introverted and uh, definitely wasn't prepared to have so many eyes on us. Um, I mean, we're making it work. I think the the majority of the feedback we're getting is so lovely and supportive and wonderful. And obviously there's gonna be some negativity when you have that many eyes on you. And I'm just trying to like push that aside and continue um, spreading kindness, compassion and connection and sharing our journey. Not really a whole lot else I can do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so someone wants to know if you're concerned about privacy with all the cameras around, that kind of goes back to uh, being introverted, having your own space. Totally. Thankfully, they're kind of all just like, wah, wah, just like on the buttons. Normally the buttons would be where I'm sitting and they're all just sort of like down and onto it. So I just don't sit naked in this part of my living room very often anymore. Sure, not, not anymore. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Off limits now. <laughs> um. Let's see, this is an interesting one. Uh, I teach my dog all the commands in English, like sit, lay down, stand up, stay, but normally I would just speak Vietnamese, their mother tongue. Uh, if I start to teach my dog to use these buttons, would you recommend me to use English and always speak English to my dog or should I use my mother tongue? I have no idea. Um, one of the things that's been interesting to me while doing this is I, some of the buttons I've added in terms of like English syntax make me wonder if English is perhaps not the most syntactically intuitive language. So I don't know, maybe Vietnamese is actually easier for a learner given the syntax or the way sentences are phrased. I don't know anything about that language, but um, I think I think you should I think you should try with your mother tongue because it sounds fascinating to me. You know, I think there's someone in the research group who is bilingual and if, if I'm not mistaken their their dog knows commands in in multiple languages yeah I think I, I remember hearing that right? too yeah so I will have to we'll have to follow up on that and and find out uh yeah, what sure. that's translated um <laughs> does bunny ever try to use buttons to get a treat I think one button what, no, we don't have any food or treat related buttons, but one time she's got this little like bouncy bowl thing that you like put stuff in, like food treats in. And um, I guess it was a while ago, so I don't remember exactly what happened, but she pressed um, come play and then like picked up the thing and like threw it at my face. <laughs> um, so it was pretty clear what she wanted was the treats in the thing. Mm -hmm. but so that was cool. she's like, she's not, she's really not very food motivated. She likes treats, but, um, you know, she's just not, yeah. it's not super important to her. She likes scritches and like yeah. scritches. She likes play. Yeah. What's, um, what's your favorite or the most interesting thing that you've learned about bunny that you maybe wouldn't have known if it weren't for the buttons? I mean, right now it's how poop focused she is. It's insane. Um, <laughs> it's like a toddler. It's like a toddler. Um, call Well, she called Johnny out for farting the other day since we added the smell button. Um, he had like just come out of the bathroom and went upstairs and she said, smell went, smell upstairs. Um, so, you know, learning about that sort of thing from my dog is hilarious. She asked me at one point where I poop, just something I'd never thought of. You know, you go on your walks with your dog and they do their business and you pick it up. Um, I never would have imagined that she'd be like, hmm, where does, where does mom do that? Huh. Yeah. The things that she, she thinks about and questions. Right. Deep thoughts. Deep, deep thoughts. Yes. Thoughts. <laughs> deep, deep poop thoughts. Yeah. 
Um, so this next question comes from my sister who is apparently in the chat right now. Hi, my sister. Um, have you sought out research on AAC for humans and children to incorporate into your practice with Bunny? Yeah, I did at the beginning quite a bit of research and it's overwhelming the amount of information that is not existing in my brain right now, like completely overwhelming. So I try and seek out sources where I can and learn as much as I can about um, different areas that might be, might be applicable to this. Um, but it's just a lot, it's a lot of information to take in. So yeah, I take it in little chunks. I've um, done some reading about ABA, about AAC, about modeling, about canine cognition. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to learn as much as I can at all times. Yeah, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot in yeah. a whole new field of use. Totally. Yeah, I'm an yeah. artist. I've never, you know, before Bunny, I'd never had a conversation about any of this with anybody or even heard of it really. So mm. yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's great. Uh, so this question is coming up a lot. Which words do you recommend to start with for beginners? Um. I would say it sort of depends on your learner, but um, outside seems to be a great word to start with because a lot of dogs are motivated by going outside. Play uh, is a great one to start with. Um, those would probably be my top two. Uh, Love You was one of our first because it's so endearing and it's such a great way to, like I said before, have that sort of oxytocin exchange to spend time really, really loving on your dog in preparation for teaching it, which is a great way to strengthen your bond. Uh, Hmm. Um, all done is a good one to start with because then, you know, we're all done outside. You've asked for outside seven times. We're not doing it anymore. All done. All done play. I can't play with you anymore. All done. So I think that would be, those are four great words to start with in my opinion. And um, when you're starting, first starting off, is there a place where you can go that you would recommend to get these buttons or the board or any other um, information? I'm yeah, so yes, how.theycantalk has some really amazing information. Uh, it's a fabulous resource for sharing tips, techniques, advice, problem solving, and Fluent Pet sells a lot of different sizes of kits. Um, they've got a starter kit with, I think, which I think is uh, two tiles and, or what is it, five tiles and two buttons? I don't remember. Sorry, Leo. Um, <laughs> but yeah, fluentpet.com has uh, great resources. And then there are the buttons on Amazon, the learning resources buttons. Um, they are not as high quality. The sound isn't as great, but if you have a huge dog, um, they're bigger. So they might be better for like a Great Dane or something like that. Mm. Um, so another chat question. Does Bunny communicate with guests in your home or just with the family? She, it's hard to say if she's communicating with guests or if she's communicating about guests with me. Um, for example, we had a film crew down here um, and towards the end of the interview, she said, uh, sound by go stranger and then looked at me. So I, I think she was probably telling me that they needed to go as opposed to communicating with them. Um, but I think there have been a couple of instances where she's made eye contact with other people and pressed some buttons. I can't remember specifically what she pressed though. Uh, and would you consider adding more vocalization buttons like you have for the question? Like the sound? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so like a bark button or what do you mean? Yeah, so I guess like other, other inflections uh, other than a question. So I guess if you were, maybe if you were mad, like a <laughs> or um, yeah, other, other vocalizations, so non-words. Yeah, I hadn't thinking. considered that. That's a super interesting idea though, I like it. Yeah, um, we can thank our YouTube chat for that, for our next thank video. You. <laughs> so if Bunny starts to play without using the button first, do you then go back and model the button before you initiate play or do you ask Bunny to press play before you then play with her. Nah, I just play with her. <laughs> yeah. If she yeah. goes to the door and scratches at the door, I just let her outside. Um, you know, I just want her to be happy. So if, if she, 
I'm never like withholding anything from her. I never insist that she press a button to like get what she wants. If she comes over and wants scratches, I'm like, please give me all the love. If she comes over with a toy, like, yeah, let's play. If she scratches at the door, let's go out. If she goes outside, I might press the concerned button or if she, I'm um, sorry, if she starts barking, I might press the concerned button because I'd love to be able to transfer that behavior from a bark to a press of the concerned button. But I just end up going over and trying to comfort her, figure out why she's barking or redirect, that sort of thing. Yeah, that, that kind of goes back to um, something that Federico said in the last interview about it kind of being like a um, multilingual. So dogs have the way that they communicate off the bat, which is a lot of body language and we're teaching them an additional way to communicate. So it's not one or the other, but it can be both. Yeah, and when our learners are in a state of emotional arousal, um, it makes sense that they would revert to their most natural form of communication. Um, so someone wants to know in the chat, uh, how and when did you first introduce the hmm button? I don't know, it must've been like four or five months ago. Um, and it, it came from a conversation that I'd had with Leo um, because we were having a hard time sort of determining what her intent was with a lot of the phrases. Like, is she telling me that this is happening or is she asking if this can happen? Um, so we sort of went back and forth on, on what to use uh, for that sort of intonation and, you know, decided on this sort of Scooby. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, then I just started adding it to the end of my questions. And interestingly enough, Bunny has only ever a couple of times used it at the end of a question. She almost always uses it at the beginning of a question. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, what influences your word choice with, with each new button that you do add? Um, I am influenced by the scientists, Leo and Federico, always give me great suggestions. Um, and then I think, like I mentioned before, I'm I'm constantly trying to think what would Bunny want to talk about? Like what's gonna motivate her to communicate in a way that's completely unnatural to her? Um, so anytime I think of, oh yeah, she's really obsessed with birds, you know, maybe I should add a bird button. Um, or, you know, talking about her friends seems to be highly motivating. I didn't expect time to be as motivating as it is, um, but she seems to really enjoy trying to sort out those concepts. So I'm always kind of trying to think what would she want to talk about and what's going to motivate her to communicate more. So so Bunny dictates what words are added next, basically. Next, yes. <laughs> She's the boss. Um, so did you, uh, prior to Bunny, did you have dogs and what, or did you have any kind of dog training experience? No, um, I've said this before, I'm completely, unqualified to be teaching my dog how to talk. I haven't had a dog since I was a young child. And even then, you know, they weren't really my dogs. I didn't train them. Um, they were just sort of like these animals that I lived with. Um, but I wanted a dog for a really, really long time and it just hadn't been situationally appropriate. Um, so yeah, before I'm, I'm also sort of like an all or nothing person. So before I got Bunny, I did a ton of research. I, I wanted to be sure that we had the best relationship, that I was able to communicate with her in as many ways as possible, um, that I was able to train her to make her life uh, enriching and fulfilled and to uh, strengthen our bond. Um, so yeah, I just did a bunch of research and I'm doing the best I can and learning every day. So what do you suggest for people uh, who go to work now or after the pandemic? Uh, should the buttons be put away when they're not there to respond? No, I don't think so. I think you should put a camera out and see what your dog does with the buttons when you're not there. How interesting would that be? That would be. That would be very different. interesting. Um, someone wants to know, how do you think your approach differs from that of Christina Hunger? Oh, she's a scientist. This is like her, her wheelhouse. My approach is completely different. Um, yeah, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, I'm just making it up as I go along. I think that my strength is um, my creativity, really. Um, I've had a lot of time to explore. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, our approaches are completely different. I love Christina. We talk, we talk fairly regularly. And, and uh, months ago, we were sort of discussing how our um, journeys had differed a little bit. And uh, she's been super helpful to me along the way, but, 
but yeah, she's taking, uh, I'm sure, a very methodical approach um, based on her education and her career path as a speech language pathologist. And I have none of that background. So yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> that would be, I would imagine it would be very different then. Yeah. Um, just a quick disclaimer on uh, leaving your dog home alone with the buttons. Um, it could potentially pose a safety issue, especially if the dogs are prone to chewing on them. So just uh, if you're going to do that, you use your discretion. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Um, how does it make you feel when Bunny tells you that she loves you? Oh, my gosh, I melt. Like who wouldn't melt? It's so, it's just the best feeling ever. It's incredible. I mean, she can tell me in so many other ways, right? But um, for some reason, hearing it uh, oddly in my own voice is is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's sweet. Um, when Bunny is upstairs and she wants to express something, will she indicate to you to come downstairs or does she vocalize like bark or something like that? We don't spend much time upstairs. I'm mostly just up there sleeping. Or um, if I'm in my studio working, she's usually just sleeping up there with me. All of the activity sort of throughout the day just happens downstairs. Uh, someone wants to know, how do you introduce the concepts of time? That sounds really hard to model. Yeah, so um, morning, afternoon, and night. Um, Every morning I come downstairs, I say it's morning now, press morning now, press good morning, morning bunny. And then afternoon, right at noon, I, I do the same thing with afternoon. Good afternoon, bunny, it's afternoon now, now afternoon. And then same with, with night, as soon as the sun goes down, now night, good night, night now. So like we were saying before, a lot of repetition. A lot of repetition. Yeah. And uh, how do you differentiate I love you from scritches? Um, I mean, that's really tricky. I feel like uh, I read a study recently about how when dogs and their humans make eye contact, um, the levels of oxytocin, which is the cuddle hormone, are elevated in both. Um, and obviously eye contact is a pretty nuanced thing in dogs and in people. Um, but I sort of take that into consideration. Love you. We're having like an oxytocin exchange. It feels a little bit different. It's more about um, the chemical reaction between us and scratches is like, okay, I'm going to give you scratches. Where do you want scratches on your ears, on your neck? Okay. The end. Bye. Mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. It's a subtle difference, but that's how I, I tend to think of it when I'm, when I'm modeling it. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. Uh, so we'll take another couple questions from the chat. Uh, right now I have one button per hex tile. Any tips on combining buttons to onto one hex tile? Like adding more than one button? I think it's like if you have one on one hex and the other on the other hex, how do you combine them onto two buttons onto one as opposed to one oh. on each? Well, if they're different um, parts of the sentence, then you want to keep the hex tiles separate. So if you have like play and outside and they're on their separate tiles, you want to keep them in their separate tiles because one's an action and one's a location, right? So if you're adding more locations, you would add them to the same hex tile as the outside button. If you're adding more actions like walk or scritches, um, then you would add that to the play hex tile. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that, that did for me to definitely okay. keep it separate to not add them together, but have them have their own place and then build around that. Yeah. Um, have you thought about teaching her the days of the week? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I haven't. That sounds really hard too, but um, yeah, I'd love to do that eventually if she's up for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and do you recommend having a singular person's voice with the button or does it matter if it's mom or dad's voice? I don't know. I, I, my sense is that it's probably good to have it be um, the voice that she hears the most. Um, but I don't really know. I think if, you know, there are two, if there's one learner and two people that are equally involved in the process, that two voices could be great. Uh, so I think this is all the time we have for our last question. Um, where, how do you envision Bunny to be in five or 10 years? I have no idea. Like I, this whole time I've, I've tried to have sort of 
zero expectations of what this process would look like and just sort of move with how our lives change and adapt and evolve. And, you know, Bunny's changing constantly. I'm changing constantly. My hope is that she's a little more snuggly in five years. Um, I hope that uh, we're able to get out and do some crazy backpacking trips together and um, that our connection continues to deepen and that our love continues to grow. I mean, it sounds super cheesy, but that's really all I want. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, our last couple of few questions. Uh, now that Bunny has so many buttons, do you just branch an additional tile of the same type next to each other or do you arrange it once you've filled up all the all of the category tiles? So if you have like, let's say 10 action words, um, how do you, do you branch off of that existing action tile or how do you go about arranging that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I probably would have been a little more methodical about how I'd arranged, how I would arrange all of the tiles had I known that we were going to have this many, but, um, yeah, I just sort of like branched down in angles like that and out like that. Um, but it's not super consistent, honestly. It's a very organic feeling. I keep all of the, like all of the action tiles are connected to each other, but they're not necessarily all in exactly the same like line. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, I could pick up my computer and show the board if you want. Sure. Let's take a quick look at the board. That's let's a good way to do this. this. Wrap this up. Okay. Wow. All right. So... Um, what's a good example? What's, what's Bunny's okay. most used word or words? Uh, poop is right here. <laughs> Body. Smell is right here. She's using, uh, hear and see and go a lot. Um, but so you can see the actions are right here, right? Um, and, uh, initially I just sort of like branched them down this way. Oh, you can't really see my finger, huh? Sorry. This is super awkward guys. <laughs> no, you're doing great. Okay, thank you. So the actions here, this is like the, the row that we started with, and then we moved down like this. Um, but mm -hmm. then I added this one over here, which is another action, which is here, because that spot felt kind of weird. Bunny was sort of using this as like a like her little standing console. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I filled it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, Bunny dictates. <laughs> I'm Bunny, Bunny is boss. Bunny is boss. Bunny is boss. <laughs> Bunny is boss. Um, what, uh, what kind of art do you do? You mentioned you're an artist. Yeah, I'm a wearable art designer. I, um, make chain mail and scale mill pieces that are used in music videos and fashion shows. I showed at uh, New York fashion week two years in a row and, uh, yeah. I mean, I can grab something and show you if you want. Yeah, I think we're, we're nearing the end of our time, but yeah. definitely, um, hopefully people will, will check that out after. Um, so we are going to have our next They Can Talk show is going to be on Monday, December 28th, featuring Clever Pet founder Leo Trottier. Um, so I hope that everyone will come back and bring your questions for that. Um, Alexis, thank you so much for sharing this hour with us. This has been uh, amazing. I know the world <laughs> is pretty amazed with you and Bunny right now. Um, so it's it's great to hear about the bond that you guys have created and, and the work that you're doing together. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much for having, having us. This has been a, a lot of fun.